Okay, good afternoon. Um, we are going to take a pretty quick whistle-stop tour through the world of soil biology. Um, perhaps a quick apology to the, uh, the lovely type, typewriter ladies down here. I might go uh, a little bit fast, but for any of the non-English native speakers, if I am going too fast, just uh, please give me a signal and I shall uh, try and slow down. So. Um, what is a healthy soil? And we've touched on this now, uh, the, th the stool with three legs, or I like to use my soil health triangle. It is a balance between the soil chemistry, the soil physics, and the soil biology. No one is more important than the other. They are all of equal importance, and they very much influence each other. When we, when we change the biology, we can change the soil's chemical and physical properties. They work as one uh, interchangeable and, and interconnected system. And this is my take-home message. Soil health is a balance between all three. Every time we make a management decision in our, in our farms, in our gardens, uh, we must ask ourselves, what are the implications of this management decision on all three of these facets of soil health? Um, okay, where am I? Where am I pointing here? Ooh. Ooh. Is it this way? Oh, there we go. Okay, um, and what drives that healthy soil? Uh, and if we represent that soil health triangle, perhaps the same but in a different way, what is at the what is the catalyst? What is at the center of those three facets? And we've touched on this now already. It is the soil organic carbon, the organic matter. It is this that is the fuel of this system. This is where these three worlds meet in the center. And, 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 and as, as both Chris and Graham have touched on, this is where we should also be focusing our energies in terms of our efforts in terms of soil, uh, soil management. So well, what drives that organic carbon? How do we build humus in the soil? It is those microbes in the soil. It is the life in the soil, and that's what we're going to jump in and discuss now. Um, they are the key ingredient that helps us to build humus, to, to improve that soil organic carbon, to make the whole system uh, work efficiently. Okay, and so how do we feed soil microbes? With carbon. Carbon feeds soil microbes, and soil microbes help to build carbon. This is one of the positive uh, feedback loops that we've kind of touched on in the course of, of these last two days already. So that again, they work in tandem. We feed microbes, we help to build humus. And the more we build humus, the more resilience we build into the soil so that microbes can thrive in that soil. So beneath the soil, there is this vast community of life a hugely, hugely diverse community and vast numbers of organisms that live in the soil. And we've touched on some of those, things like bacteria, fungi, protozoa, nematodes, soil insects, earthworms. Uh, these are the organisms that all live underneath, uh, in the soil underneath our feet and come together in this community uh, that we call the soil food web. Now, uh, this is a nice, di uh, we've probably, perhaps many of you have seen this picture, uh, a nice uh, diagram of, of this underground world of life. And at the bottom of this food web is the food source, is the carbon, is this organic matter. This is the source of energy that then feeds, that flows upwards and feeds the life in the soil. They need this carbon, this organic matter down here at the bottom and nutrients then flow upwards through this system. And at the bottom here, we have two very important groups which we're gonna zone in on and discuss today, bacteria and fungi. They are called our primary decomposers. Their primary role is to decompose and feed on the food and incorporate that food into the living, into the soil food web, so that that nutrients can flow and that carbon can flow upwards into this into this living system. So their role is very important and we're gonna come back to those guys. And then above the bacteria and fungi, up here we have what we call our predators. And these are organisms that eat other organisms primarily. Some of these do feed on carbon too. But these are organisms that eat other organisms for their nourishment, for their nutrition. 
So we're going to come back to this chart as we flow along now. So another one just to sneak in there is algae. We often don't hear too much about algae. We, we often people will talk about biology and start with bacteria and fungi. Well, al algae are essentially microscopic plants. They are also an important contributor at, to the food source at the base of this soil food web. They photosynthesize, they breathe in carbon dioxide, they produce sugars and carbohydrates, and they exude those out into the soil for the bacteria and for the fungi to feed on. So they are also important contributors uh, to the uh, as, as plant life to, to feeding the, the soil food web. Okay, so we jump to our bacteria first. What do bacteria do in soil? They are microscopic, single-celled little organisms. What they lack in size, they make up in numbers. Vast, vast numbers. Billions and billions of bacteria in a single teaspoon of soil. Their role is to feed on that organic matter. Again, primary, decompose that, that carbon, the food source, coming into the system. Uh, bacteria uh, grow they're, they're in, in colonies or they can be quite free living uh, as they grow and as they feed on that soil organic matter. They exude all sorts of substances into the soil environment. Many of those are quite sticky and they start to glue soil particles together and we form these little micro aggregates that the bacteria start to glue soil particles together forming this aggregates, this structure that we have touched on already. Uh, so this is what the bacteria do in the, in, in the soil. Uh, we also have a, 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 a very a huge number of bacteria in the soil, but only a small percentage is only ever active or alive or feeding. And in this slide here, you can see uh, some glowing bacteria. We've used a stain here that the alive, the feeding bacteria, have absorbed the stain so that we shine a UV light and they, they glow and they fluoresce. So these are the active, awake bacteria. But in the rest of this slide, uh, in all of the rest of this space here, there is a huge number of dormant, inactive bacteria. This would be 10% or so in soils, are, the microbes are, are active at any one time, ballpark. Uh, and this huge diversity of dormant organisms also are very, very important because soils are hugely uh, dynamic ecosystems. They fluctuate on an hourly basis, on a daily basis, on a monthly, on a seasonal, on a yearly basis. The temperature extremes, the moisture extremes. The soils are hugely diverse and dynamic and it is very hard for a single organism to withstand and survive all of those conditions. So we have a huge, this is why we have vastness of life in soil, is because of it is a vast, uh, it, a harsh world to live in. And so these dormant organisms, as the soil moisture content changes, all of these glowing bacteria would go to sleep and they'll go dormant and all of the dormant ones will wake up and fill that niche so that we can have that constant cycle of life in ha working in the soil. So they're feeding on organic matter. And then we have our fungi. They're also the other primary decomposer. Fungi are multi-celled organisms. They grow in these long strands or threads called hyphae. And uh, similarly, uh, fungi are also exuding, feeding on that carbon and exuding byproducts and waste products, gluey, sticky substances into the soil. But this physical growth habits, the way in which they, uh, these strands and threads grow into the soil, means that they have a very big influence on the structure of the soil. They physically change the structure of the soil as these hyphae grow through the soil. And this is a very, very important point which we'll return to. And here's another picture here of some branching hyphae uh, um, uh, feeding on that organic matter, gluing uh, sticky substance, again releasing sticky substances. And, and uh, as those hyphae grow through the soil, we talked about bacteria producing little micro aggregates. Well, these hyphal strands grow through and pull micro aggregates together into larger macro aggregates. And when we have macro aggregates in this uh, aggregated structured soil, in between there we have pore space. And this is where we have our oxygen. Uh, this is our, where our moisture can move through the soil. Two very, very important uh, nutrients. Uh, not nutrients, sorry, factors in soil health. <laughs> And then uh, we, we, could, we could probably stand here and talk a whole day about this special group of fungi called mycorrhizal fungi. That's a spelling bee special for the ladies if they don't know that one. Um, mycorrhizal fungi. 
Um, they are a special type of fungi that uh, work synergistically with the plant. They actually colonize the plant root system and they grow out into the soil environment with these same fine uh, hyphae. These fungi are not primary decomposers. They don't really feed on uh, so much on organic matter, the humus there. They uh, feed with the plant. The plant photosynthesizes, cat breathes in that CO2, produces sugars and carbohydrates, sends those to the roots to feed that fungi. And that fungi grows out into the soil and accesses moisture and nutrients and pipes those moisture and nutrients back to the plant so that the plant can photosynthesize more and produce more sugars and send those back down. And we, it's, we, depending, we know that mycorrhizal fungi can increase the plant's access to soil volume anywhere from 10 to 1,000% increase in so accessing of the soil volume. What are the implications of that for our, our irrigation, our water requirements, for our nutrient requirements when the soil is, uh, uh, ac when the plants are accessing such greater soil volume? Okay, and then we have our, pr our predators, uh, the higher level predators. These are protozoa. They're, these are single celled animals. Their primary role in soil is to eat bacteria. And when they eat bacteria, like all organisms, they eat, they consume, they metabolize, and they excrete waste products. And those waste products are nutrients that are cycled back into the system for other organisms or for plants to take up, for plants to withdraw, absorb those nutrients for their, uh, for their mineral nutrition. Uh, then we also have our nematodes. Now, most, uh, I think, growers and farmers are well aware of the root-feeding nematodes, the plant parasitic nematodes. These are the uh, nematodes that cause damage to our crops. Well, actually, there is a far greater number of beneficial nematodes in soil, much greater diversity of beneficials. We just don't hear too many of those. And here we have the root feeding or the plant parasitic nematode. It has this stylet or this, this structure, this spear-like structure here called a stylet that uh, projects out of its mouth, punctures the plant root system and, it, and feeds on the uh, exudates and sugars from the plant, feeds on that root system, ultimately causing rot and, and decay in that root system. But we have these other beneficial uh, nematodes as well. Uh, nematodes that eat bacteria. You can see they have these fine hairs at their mouth that help to scoop in the bacteria and eat bacteria. Uh, fun uh, nematodes that feed on fungi, they have this straw-like structure to suck in that fungal hyphae and feed on that hyphae. And then we have nematodes that eat other nematodes. These are, of course, great biocontrol agents to encourage more predatory nematodes who will then consume our plant parasitic nematodes. Uh, so, and as, the, or as these nematodes eat the bacteria or eat the fungi or eat the other nematodes, again, they metabolize, they excrete waste products, and those waste products is, is how the plant feeds itself, accesses those nutrients uh, in, in natural ecosystems. And so we have our soil insects. Their primary role is to shred organic matter, to physically grind down and break down organic matter into smaller particle sizes so that the bacteria and fungi can then start to do their decomposition. Uh, earthworms, uh, again, similar, uh, breaking down, physically breaking down organic matter, redistributing that organic matter down into, into depths, creating those lovely channels and pores and structure that we see here. Uh, in this lovely picture, um, of course, creating channels for moisture and, and, uh, and oxygen. Uh, a really good example of this interface of uh, biology and physics, biology changing the physical structure of the soil. And so all of these organisms then, and we have our, our other animals going up beyond there, and all of these organisms come together in this uh, a wonderful ecosystem called the soil food web and how these things all interact and eat each other and work synergistically with each other. Now, this is how I touched on these nutrients are cycled and made available. Uh, every, every time a protozoa eats a bacteria, it spits out these waste products which the plant can absorb. These are how plant forests and plants in natural ecosystems get their nutrients. The nutrients are released. Now, if we look at soil chemistry, uh, we won't go into, into any great detail, but if we look at a, a, a soil analysis or um, look at the nutrients that exist in soils, they exist in, very, in three different forms. Uh, some of the nutrients that exist in soils are highly soluble and available. They cycle in a very short-term, hourly, daily basis. Uh, these are the soluble forms. But we also have more medium-term supply of nutrients. These are called exchangeable. These are released slowly over, a bit slower over time. And then we have a total pool of nutrients. These are 
insoluble and unavailable to the plant. But over time, these nutrients move this way down into the, into the soluble pool for the plant to take up. And the key, the catalyst for cycling nutrients and accessing nutrients in mineral reserves in the soil is the biology. It is those interactions that we've just discussed that bring nutrients in a very unavailable form down into an available form for the plant to take up. Now, one of the big criticisms of a soil chemistry analysis is that soil analysis often just looks here. And if the nutrient is deficient here, be it any of your nutrients, macro or micro, if it is, new, if it is deficient here, we might say, well, there's not enough soluble nutrients in the soil, we better put a bag of fertilizer on. We better put some more nu nutrient on. Well, actually, there's this more of that nutrient, but it's just up here. And there's even more of that nutrient, but it's up here. We don't necessarily need more fertilizer, we need more biological activity to bring those nutrients down into the available form. Um, thank you. So we're going to zoom now quickly into building humus, carbon sequestration, the question we had there. So plants, as they photosynthesize, they breathe in carbon dioxide, they produce sugars and carbohydrates, they send those down to the root system and they exude those out of the root system to feed the life in the soil, to feed those organisms in the soil. Uh, it, it, we often hear this figure of about 30 odd percent of the plant's net photosynthate, net energy that it captures, it will exude out of the root system. It can be anywhere from 5 up to 80% in, in, in times. So the plants exude sugars out into the soil, they give away their energy. And this is not a loss, this is not a waste for the plant, this is an investment. It is feeding the biology because it knows that the biology can access that, cycle those nutrients and bring those back for the plant. So depending on the soil biology in the soil, depending on that balance of organisms and how biologically active those soils are, those exudates that the plant exudes and leaks out of its root system have the potential to be captured and stored in the soil. And the role of bacteria and fungi are very, very important in this equation. So our current understanding suggests that fungi are much more important than, the, than bacteria to uh, sequester carbon and build humus. And this is for three reasons. One, fungi are larger organisms. They s physically store more carbon in their own biomass, in those long threads, uh, those hyphal threads. So they store more carbon in their bodies. Uh, their, their byproducts, their waste products, as, car as fungi feed, they exude these waste products. Their waste products are larger chain carbon compounds. They're more recalcitrant, they're more resistant to degradation, bigger, longer chain carbon, which is more resistant to degradation. So their byproducts are larger than bacterial byproducts, which are smaller and break down easy, more easy. And fungal hyphae promote soil aggregation through this physical growth habit uh, of the fungal hyphae. Uh, and, and so this is a nice way to illustrate that. Here we have soil in a dispersed state. We have a high surface area around each of these little particles. High oxygen, um, high oxygen can access there. We can see oxidation of our carbon back off uh, into the atmosphere as CO2. If we have, just picture some fungal hyphae, those strands or threads growing up into, into, this, into those particles, releasing those gluey substances, sticking the structure together to form this nice soil aggregate. Remember, this is a 3D structure. This is a ball. This is a sphere. And within that ball now, all of the organic matter and carbon within that aggregate is physically protected from oxygen and oxygenation. And so it can't be broken down and lost back as CO2. So in aggregated soils, we have uh, pre physically protected that carbon and sequestered that carbon and keeping it in the soil rather than losing, uh, losing that soil. And here we have a nice picture of some compost, actually, but uh, of some fungal hyphae. Again, structure. Structure is in motion right here. Look at the, fu the fungal strands here and, uh, that you can see here, and look at the dark spaces, the black poor spaces. Look at the structure there that we see in this picture. And, and here we are creating space uh, for these aggregates and it is these perfectly structured aggregates that are the sites of protection of carbon and also maximum carbon sequestration and, and, and synthesis and protection of that carbon within those aggregates. And so this is, a, I guess, another one of my kind of final closing kind of take-home messages. When we then think about bacteria and fungi in our soils, 
just follow this chart with me, our carbon inputs, and these could be some, uh, those root exudates that I mentioned, those photosynthates going down, exuding by the plant. Maybe our residues, maybe some compost manures, our green manures. The food source that's coming into this system will be either fed on uh, by either a bacteria or fungi, or a balance of both. Now, if we have a dominance of bacteria in the soil, and bacteria eat at the table first, well, they gobble up all that carbon, and the carbon flows, into the, flows in this direction, into the bacterial biomass. And as the bacteria feed on that carbon, well, they breathe, and they respire, and we lose a bit of CO2, but their byproducts, their waste products, are smaller, and therefore less stable in the soil, and more easily further broken down by other organisms, or by oxidization and lost back as CO2. If we had more fungi in our soils, and fungi ate at the table first, well, that carbon will flow down into the fungal biomass. And when fungi feed and do their thing in the soil and feed on that carbon, yes, they respire and breathe as well, but their byproducts, their waste products, are larger chain and more stable. And when we produce more stable, larger chain carbon compounds, well, they remain in the soil. And we, this leads to greater humus production, greater carbon sequestration and storage in the soil. Now, the reason I say this is that, yes, we want a balance of all of, of, all of these organisms, but in our, typically in our disturbed agricultural soils, they are very bacterial dominated. So if you disturb your soil all the time, and yet you're doing all this good thing, and feeding it, and feeding it, and feeding it, putting all this compost in, well, all of that effort, if bacteria are eating most of that, if a dominance of bacteria are eating that, this is your end point. If you get more fungal in the soil, this is your end point. Okay, and so a final quote to, uh, actually nice kind of link to, to some of Chris's comments earlier, um, that I'll just read you this, one of my favorites, to summarize, the achievement of sustainable agriculture was let down in the 20th century when research focused strongly on soil chemical and physical factors and neglected the biological factors. Yes, I've touched on soil biology today. Yes, it is a crucial catalyst and ingredient in the mix. But soil chemistry and soil physics, that soil health triangle, are also of great importance. So always consider all three. Um, but yes, our research is now catching up in the world of soil biology. Okay, um, thank you very much. Uh, let's open to some questions. Um, if, if, uh, if, the, if you'd like some more information, um, I'm doing some one-day courses, one in Worcestershire and London. Uh, come see me, or you can find some information on the website there, doing a full one-day course all about this stuff. So. Thank you. I've got your flyers here okay. for those courses. There we go. Yeah. Thank you. Any other I th questions? Well, I think this, questions. this lady here, yeah. yeah. So my question was related to how do you actually increase the fungi? And uh, related to uh, non-temperate, uh, I'm from India, so mm -hmm. perhaps reference to that more than, you know. So basically, how do we do that? Yes, sure. There's only so much we can do in 20 minutes. Um, so yeah, yeah. I mean, the, the, the comments that have been touched on, we need to feed the organisms. It's about feeding the right, similarly, fungi exude more complex carbon chains, which are stable. They also like to feed on more complex carbon forms. So we need to feed them the right types of carbon that they like to feed on, that they will then sequester. So, so fungi prefer more drier, woody material. They like you know, things like wood chip, of course. This, this is materials with a, a very wide or high carbon to nitrogen ratio. It's a very dry, fibrous, woody material. This is, why, of course, why we see fungi in our forest ecosystems feeding on those logs, etc. Um, they don't love forms of carbon that are very small, like sugars and molasses and fresh green leafy material. Yes, they will feed on those too, but they prefer drier, uh, more carboniferous material. That's what they will feed on and then also exude. Uh, so, so that would be part of the answer. Um, uh, in a, 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 I mean, give, give them a habitat, give them an environment, and give them some food, is, I guess, is the simple answer. Yes, in a tropical environment where higher temperatures, uh, we see a much faster turnover of carbon. Of course, it is harder to build humus in, in, in temperate climates because of the temperature it uh, sorry, in warm climates, because of the temperature, just everything is cycling faster. Um, but I, I guess the same rules, maybe it'll take a bit longer, but the same rules. Give them the environment, give them the feed source. Uh, using things like composts, give them the uh, environment to uh, live on and in the soil, and then to, to kind of feed them with those right food sources as well. 
Um, a quick answer. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I, get, I guess the lady here. Yeah. Hello. Um, thank you, first of all. Also, um, I have a friend. We're trying to homestead in upstate New York, so it's a temperate region. We have a lot of rain. Um, we've had a lot of invasive worms, actually, that have been eating straight through our organic matter in the forest, and we haven't found a way to attract enough predators to minimize their effects, um, and we're losing our carbon really quickly. Do you have any recommendations? Wow, invasive worms. Yeah, yeah. they've moved northward, and <laughs> they just eat through everything extremely fast. Wow, do they then move on, though? or do they No, have... they, they stay. <laughs> They're everywhere. Um, I'm, I'm not too sure, to be honest. Um, happy to open the floor if anyone else has any suggestions there. But uh, for not being familiar with them, I, I'm not sure. But sure, do you want to? Soldier fly larvae. No, it's a worm of some kind. Yeah. They're earthworms. <laughs> I'm not sure, to be honest. And they're definitely a negative species. Or... Okay. Oh, it eats other earthworms as well. Okay. Okay. Any other questions? I'm not sure, sorry. I'm not sure. the breakdown enough they, they don't usually they don't usually exist in the forest so they're not native and um, they just change the cycle enough to this be a problem okay last okay. question please you seem to be uh, where would you like to see your work in five years <laughs> Um, one sentence only, please. Yes, yes. Uh, this is a nice, easy one. Uh, honestly, if you look into the scientific literature, it is well uh, regarded, is well acknowledged that we know a percent, a one or two percent about the life in the soil. We have only just begun to scratch the surface. It is the tip of the tip of the iceberg. And, and it is only in the recent years, it is our advances in... Um, uh, G DNA, molecular-based uh, uh, technologies that is enable us, enabling us to um, study the diversity of this ecosystem. So there is so much still to learn, uh, and we're literally only just beginning. Uh, so uh, I, I guess I'm just excited about where that is going to go. And the role of these organisms in, I think my interest is particularly in the role of these organisms helping uh, some of our conventional farmers in their transition to more sustainable uh, systems, uh, helping them to use less chemicals and use less fertilizers and using these microbes uh, as substitutes or, or natural replacements to kind of get the system naturally cycling, I guess is my particular interest in, in those transitional kind of early stages. So. Thank you very much okay. indeed. Yeah. Thank okay. you. Thank you.